My full name is Faye Etta Anderson. I um, go by Faye. My mom said that, well, my middle name is Leanne, so my full name is Faye Etta Leanne Anderson, and she says that she was going to call me Leanne till I was born, and she said I look like a Faye. So I'm good with Faye. I, I love my name. I like the uniqueness of it. It's not something you hear very often, and I feel blessed and honored that she chose that name for me. Um, when I first met Shelly, she had this name book and she would make these little cards for people that would tell you what your name means. And so I found it shortly after I reconnected with her in 2020 and Fayetta means full of trust and Leanne means consecrated one. And I mean, how awesome is that, that you can be full of trust and consecrated to the one who matters more than anything else. So I, I, I do love my name as a kid. I wasn't sure about it, but as an adult, I will tell you today that, that I am honored that my mother gave me that name. Um, this morning, I came in early and prepared my message, did a run through, and I was like, wow, God, that's awesome. You gotta do it again, because I don't remember anything I said. <laughs> so we're gonna trust that he is going to deliver like he did this morning because he touched my heart through the words that I was speaking. And I'm going to trust that he's going to do the same for you. And I just want to, I'm going to take a minute because it's been a very hectic day. It's been a hectic couple of months. And I just want to center up because when I center to him, then I know he flows through me and out of me and you guys get him and not me, and that's my desire, is that you guys get him today. So, Father, I center up to you. Lord, I surrender my life to you, my words, my thoughts, and my actions. Lord, let everything that is brought forth in this moment be from you and you alone. Prepare the hearts of these women to receive your love. I thank you, and I praise you for it all. In Jesus' name. So, I'm going to introduce my family. They say it takes a village to raise your children. This is my village. This is my family. We are very large and very close. We had five, my mom had five children, and I think she has 30-some grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And it literally has taken my entire family helping me raise my two kids. And these are my children and my granddaughter. I do not have a picture of just me and my children together, not since they were like seven and nine, or I guess 10. <laughs> so it's been a while. But Brianna is, she's my daughter by marriage. And when that marriage ended, she became and will always be my daughter. She is, I love her as much as I love my son Blaine. And I can't imagine my life without the two of them in it. They, they are remarkable. She's a mar remarkable woman and a remarkable man. And I know one day they're going to rise up into the things of the Lord. And when they do, they are going to surpass my wildest expectations. And these are my beautiful grandbabies. You know, being a grandparent is probably the best thing in the world. You never realize that something that's just under two feet tall can make you feel like you're 20 feet tall. I walk into a room and the two come running, screaming, Mamma, Mamma, and my grandson will not let go. So this is Kason. He is Mamma's boy. If I'm at home, he's on my hip. He never lets go. If Mamma's going, he's like, Go wish you, Mamma go wish you memo. So he is amazing. And this is my granddaughter who is just turned four. Her name is Amaya. And she is smart as a 17 year old. She truly, truly is. I mean, she blows my mind at how the big words she uses and actually understands them and uses in the correct context. And she's done it since she was probably 14 months old. Very very, very energetic, and she has a mind that cannot be stifled. It's always wondering. She reminds me of Dennis the Menace. 
Kind of like you see the red button and I have to push the red button. That's my granddaughter. But I love her and she has a love for God that she doesn't really recognize that that's what it is yet, but she does because we were at church a few months ago and she was just worshiping and we were able to actually catch, capture it on camera and she just had her hands extended just worshiping the Lord. And how awesome is that, that you get, I, I as a grandparent get to enjoy watching my, both my grandchildren worship my God and my King. And so in preparation for today, I, like I said, I've been praying about this conference since January. God laid it on my heart in October of last year when I went to the North Georgia Leadership Conference. And in January, he just began to bring it to fruition. I thought it was something that I would help co-lead, and he says, you're to take the lead. And I was like, really? Okay. But he actually has taken the lead. I have surrendered to him everything that you have seen down to the speakers, the catering, the help. God has ordained every bit of it. And I want to do a special thanks real quick to Kim Long and to Rachel Lanigan. Those two have just kind of stepped up to the plate today. Just what can I do? What can I do? And they've done it flawlessly. So thank you ladies so much for doing that. And Miss Leah Kaufman is back there on the soundboard with the beautiful blue-eyed baby girl. <laughs> um, sh she's doing what I typically do when I'm here on ser in service on Sundays and any other time the church doors are open, <laughs> is running Pro Presenter, and she so graciously said yes to my will you, <laughs> please. And um, she's done it flawlessly as well. And so thank you, Leah, for once again, for just coming in and, and doing that. So God has orchestrated and he has put it all into place. And now it's time for me to bring the word that I feel like he has for you guys. And so in praying about it, he's given me lots of things over the past 10 months. And about two months ago, I was walking into my house and he says, I want you to share our love story. I was like, oh, wow, that's big, right? How do you put into words how well the creator of the universe loves you? How, how do I even begin to do that? And he says, I'll show you. And so a couple Wednesday nights ago, we're sitting here in intercessory prayer, and he laid it out. And as I have shared, you know, with Tammy and Cherie and Shelly, how each one of them have a very intricate part on why I'm here today. They wouldn't have had a foundation to build on if it wasn't for my mom and my dad. We were raised in church our whole lives. And even in the midst of everything going on, I watched my mother serve God recklessly. I mean, I can't think of a better word to use than to abandon all because everything that went on in our lives, good, bad, or indifferent, she was serving the Lord. She got saved when I was just a month old. And from there, God just began to pursue. And in Jeremiah, it's chapter 1, verse 5, he tells Jeremiah, he says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. And I set you apart, and I've appointed you to be a prophet. So when you think about how powerful that is, that God knows each and every one of us before we were ever formed in our parents, our mother's wombs, before we were ever conceived, he knew exactly who we were. He knew you before your mother knew you. I mean, we're all moms, or, you know, and women in here, and, and if you are a mother and you've had a child, you know that the minute you conceive, you know and it's like you just, you begin to, to make that connection, right? So that's at conception, but he knew before. And how awesome it is that he knew then that he appointed me to be here today for such a time as this. And he says the same to you. He's, you guys are not here by accident. 
You're not here by mishap or, oh, somebody invited me. You're here today because he appointed you for such a time as this. And when you think about how well he knows us, you can't help but love him, right? And so my love story begins with the Lord of him pursuing me. We learn in Caneo that this right here is all a pursuit of him coming after you because he wants communion and relationship with you. Like I said, my mom got saved when I was just a month old. And I believe at that point in time in my life, God placed a desire for him in my heart. I believe desire was actually there when I was conceived. Because I've always, for as long as I can remember, wanted him. Sheree and Shelly and Tammy pretty much all gave you my message. <laughs> Just bits and pieces of it. But today, we're going to look at that same message from the perspective of him pursuing you. I, like Cherie, lost my innocence and my purity at a young age. It was stolen. It was taken from me. And it was something that I endured for many years. And family didn't know. Nobody knew because what the enemy does, he comes in and he lies. And he tells us in those moments, we're unworthy. And then shame comes in and guilt comes in because we no longer feel like we matter. Because what should be innocence as a child where you can go and play with sidewalk chalk outside and be free, you now have things going through your head trying to comprehend why. But in those moments, his love is there. And he showed me through the years how he'd always been there. And I remember, like I said, my, my family didn't know and I, I kept it as quiet as possible. I mean, I really don't think I actually talked about it until I was in my late teens, early 20s. And I had gone, was going through some counseling at the time through the Center for Women's Ministry. And I remember leaving church one Sunday. I was 23 years old. I can see it in my mind's eye like it was yesterday. My dad had bought me some yellow Dodge car. I can't even tell you what make and model it was, but he could because he loves Dodge. Dodges. And so I remember driving up the hill on County Line Road. I can't tell you the message that was preached at church that day. All I knew was in that moment, I wanted more of him. So I prayed, and I said, God, whatever it is that's keeping me from being where I need to be with you, take it. It's yours. Now, when you pray a prayer like that, you better be ready. Because his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And how he chooses to move is not going to be how, and it wasn't how, I thought he was going to move. My idea was, you're going to bring all these people in my life into line with you, and then I'm going to be able to have these people in my life, and we're going to be able to serve you together. That's not what happened. Within two weeks of me praying that prayer, my life that I knew around me had completely dissolved. The guy I had been dating for over seven years ended a relationship. And I got angry with God for the first time. You see, my whole life, through all my abuse and all the things that I endured, I never blamed him because I had a, had a love for him. I wanted, I wanted him to love me for me. And he showed me that here recently that in my pursuit of all these things throughout my life, I was seeking his purity and his acceptance. So 
the age of 23, I get angry because, you know, he didn't move how I expected. I mean, how many times do we do that? Do we pray and we ask God to move in our lives, but we're like, okay, wait a minute, God, that's not what I was thinking, so you can't actually move in my life. And we, we pull the reins back in and say, God, you can't have them. I mean, we do that so often that we keep the Lord from being able to move because we get scared or we don't like the fact that we got to face the hurts and the pains of our life, right? And so I get on an airplane headed for Florida and I sit in my seat and I buckle it up and I said, okay, Lord, I'm leaving you behind on this trip. Another thing I don't recommend. And I did, I was, I, I said, I was, I told him, I said, I'm going to leave you behind. And so I fly to Florida, I go and I stay with a friend. She doesn't know what I've prayed. She doesn't know that I've asked God to consume my life, essentially, of whatever's there, take it. All she's thinking about is, hey, we're going to go have fun. Those who know me, they know that I'm pretty serious. I don't, I'm not a very funny person. Usually when I'm trying to be serious, that's when people think I'm funny. And so it doesn't usually work out because I don't get what's funny. So anyway, she was all just gung-ho about taking me to go party. And you would have to know me that that's never been me. I don't party. I don't drink. I've never smoked anything. I definitely don't do pills. And, you know, it's just that, that was just not the path I took. And in that moment, we go out and we drink and it didn't go well for me. I went from being in the state that I'm in right now to being in the bathroom, being sick. And I remember getting back to her house and crawling into bed and telling God, it's like, if you get me through this moment, I will never walk away from you again. I will never leave you behind again if you get me through this moment. Because I, that is probably the worst I have ever felt in my life. And I was like, I never want to feel this way again. And so I had made that decision that I was never going to walk away from him again. And that really started my pursuit of him. But in that pursuit of him, I was seeking his love. I wanted, I wanted to know that I was loved by him. Because when you, when you go through a life of, you know, promiscuity, because I was very promiscuous, I, my thought was, you know, well, I don't even know what it's like, so what does it matter, right? Not that that's the mindset to have, but that was the mindset I had. It was another lie from the enemy that kept me trapped in that shame and guilt that I was in. And so in, in that, I began to pursue him for him. And it led me to a retreat. I actually had met with a counselor of mine, and I don't even know why we went to her house. It was me and a couple of my, I think my sister and a couple of her friends, because like I shared earlier, I, I didn't have female friends. And um, we're at her house, and she looked at me, and she said, Faye, she goes, you have a spirit of lust in your life. And I said, oh, that's not possible. I'm a Christian. Christians don't have those things. So I told her, I said, you're wrong. I said, you're absolutely wrong. That is so not me. And she's like, well, she goes, you need to go to this retreat. She goes, I'm going to go. So naturally, the only reason I'm going is because she's supposed to be going. Well, she doesn't show. And as, I'm, as I get there, I'm late. I remember calling my mom. I pull over because this was before cell phones. I find a bunch of change in my car. I actually probably called Collect. Did I call Collect? And start saying, no one me, I probably called Collect. So I call my mom Collect from the payphone, and I'm like, I have no clue where I'm going. I'm coming home. I'm crying. I'm in tears, devastated, because I knew I was supposed to go, but it just wasn't working out. And so my mom's like, if the enemy's fighting you this hard, it must be meant to be. And so she went into my room, found me the papers. I made a phone call. And by the grace of God only, because you would have to know me in directions, if it's not on GPS, I don't make it. I made it there. And I can't tell you how. I mean, it was out in the middle of nowhere. I absolutely, I mean, I don't know if Shelly's still here because she has to leave early at some point in time. But she can tell you it is out in the middle of nowhere. And so I get there. And this is where I met Shelly. When I said I met her and she was worshiping the Lord. And I thought, you know, who does she think she is? I did my very best to avoid her that entire weekend. <laughs> God had better plans in store. 
because he knew what he was doing. And in that, I remember there was a night we have to go to the altar and you're praying and you're asking the Lord to give you a, good, a new name because you're asking the Lord to tell you how he sees you. And I love that he brought in Jacob for this theme and, and for the encounter because it's in that moment where I encountered Christ at that altar. And he says, Faye, he goes, you're full of love. And that's how he sees me, is full of love. And so still I continue to pursue him for his love. I want him to love me. I wanted somebody to choose me for me, not for the things that they could get from me. I wanted him. I desired him. You know, um, in Psalms 42, I believe it's 42 to 43 too. I saw my notes here. David is crying out. It's, you know, he says, my, my heart thirsts for you. That's where I was at. I was thirsting for God, for more of him. Not really having a full understanding of it, but I was thirsting for more of him. And God did amazing work for me. And in that moment, and it was through that that I met Cherie. And God just began to use her as a mentor in my life. And he showed me during that season, he says, I took all those broken places in your life and I protected you under my wings. Because see, when we go through things like that, we don't, we don't walk away unmarked. We're broken. I was shattered. I had a lot of places in my life that needed to be healed. And through his love and through the love of his son and through a ministry out of Carmel, God made me whole again. I remember I was in one of my counseling sessions and Sandy Bowman and Shelly were there with me. And I think it was one of the, close to the last times that we were there. And the, um, we're sitting there and we're praying and I close my eyes and I have a vision. It's probably the first time the Lord spoke to me in a vision like that. And I saw Jesus carrying a younger version of myself. And he just walked right into me. And he says, this is how much I love you. I've made you whole. And so I remember walking out of that and being on cloud nine. I, I'm in a Bible study with Sheree, which Sheree is an amazing teacher. I, I learned so much wisdom from her in that. And I remember going through that season of my life and just being, you know, just gung-ho for the Lord. And I don't know if Sheree remembers the conversation or not. We were in her car one day. She had that, was it, I think you had a bug, I think, if I remember correctly. And we're sitting in her car, and she says, Faye, she goes, there's a season in your life that's going to come where you don't get to hang out with Shelly like you do now. You're going to, in order to spend time with her, you're going to have to, like, schedule appointments. And I was like, nah, that's not happening. I mean, that's what I thought to myself. I would never disrespect Cherie by saying that to her. <laughs> but that was my thought process. And she said, she told me, she goes, right now, she says, you're here. She goes, but you will level out. And she says, it's when you level out that God's going to begin to take you places. And I remember as I leveled out, a man walked into my life. And it was a very, very quick courtship. We dated for four weeks, were engaged for four weeks, and married. Now, you would think after all that God's done for me and me receiving his love, that I would heed his voice, right? Because I've already told him, I'll never, I'll never leave you behind again, right? February the 6th, 2001, I left Cherie's Bible study. And the whole way to the courthouse here in Martinsville, God says, now's not the time. Don't do it. But because I had let sin creep into the relationship and I allowed guilt and shame to come back into my life, I found myself once again disobeying God. 
the sad part about all of that is, is in 1999, after my friend had told me I had a spirit of lust in my life, I had gone to a night watch at Hoosier Harvest Church. It's just an all-night prayer service. And at that prayer service, God kept telling me, he said, you need to be set free from, fri- from pride, fear, and lust. And I knew it was him because he had done enough healing in my life that I knew that those things existed, even though I was a Christian and serving him. I knew they were things I carry, just like Tammy shared earlier. When we think that we can do things without God, it's pride. When we choose to rely on our own selves to solve situations, which I'm a fixer. Any of you all fixers? Like, if there's a problem, I got to fix it. Yeah. God is healing that in me, by the way. Um, So when we rely on ourselves to fix things, we then are not trusting God and and we live in that fear. And lust was in my life from a very, very young age. And so that night, God kept speaking to me and speaking to me, and the night comes to an end because I kept arguing with him that that wasn't the time, this isn't the season, not now, not here. And he says, again to me, as we're all circling around the altar to end the session, he says once again, you need to be set free from pride, fear, and lust. And I said, okay, if this is really you speaking this to me, then you open the door. It didn't take 30 seconds. Shelly walks over, puts her hand on my shoulder, and she says, you don't have to go to church here to receive prayer. So in that moment, in front of 40 strangers, I told them that I needed to be set free from pride, fear, and lust. And so that's what God did. He set me free that night. And so that was in 1999. Two short years later, I find myself walking into not really knowing what I was walking into. God knew, right? He showed me earlier this year, I was reading in Judges, it's Judges 10.10, and he's talking about how the Israelites chose to worship Baal. You know, that was a big thing with the Israelites. They struggled with idolatry. They wanted the things, you know, the grass was always greener on the other side of the fence, so they were always wanting the things of the cities around them instead of trusting God. And because of that, God says, okay, I'm, I'm going to let you walk into this, but when you go into that, I'm going to let you worship Baal, but when you go into that, you're going to come under oppression. You're going to come under slavery, and you're going to come under these things. And so as I'm reading this, in Judges 10.10, 10, it says, in the Isra- after 18 years, the Israelites cried out in repentance. So you think about that. 18 years is a very long time to choose to live in disobedience, to choose to live in oppression, to choose to live in that state of mind. So I asked asked the Lord, it's like, God, why did it take 18 years? So he says to me, why did it take you? And in that moment, I realized that over the past, that 18 years of my life, He was there. His love was there. But it was a tough love, right? Because not all love is flattery. Not all love is that new love that we get to experience, right? Sometimes with our kids when we're disciplining them, it's a tough love, right? And so during the 18 years of my marriage, I was put into an oppression because... The man I chose to marry was hurt. He was broken. And unfortunately, I became the outlet of those hurts and insecurities and brokenness. I went from all kinds of abuse as a child. God setting me free from that, walking on cloud nine, to being under oppression that pulled me away from friends and family pulled me away almost from God because he was physically, emotionally, spiritually, and verbally abusive. And so 
I endured that. And it's funny because, you know, when you go through that, it didn't seem that big of a deal to me. Once again, I didn't really tell my family. My kids did. I didn't. Because the lies of the enemy come in with that guilt and that shame because I knew that I had made a wrong decision. I'm not saying that if I had been, been obedient and waited that we wouldn't have married. I don't know. But I know that I wouldn't have my daughter, my grandchildren, or my son. And so God loves us through those times in our lives, even when we choose to walk in disobedience. So in 2018, I found myself making the decision to put God first. And just like in when I was at the age of 23, my world fell apart. In 2019, God gave me a vision. The vision played out in my home. And I knew I was no longer safe and I had to leave. But then that brings me here today. Because through his love, he's there. And he is a God of second chances. We're learning in the complexity of God's calling, which is in the degree program for Kaneo with Jonah. Jonah knowingly, just like I did, disobeyed God. He got onto a boat headed in the complete opposite direction of where God was sending him. And storms and trials came. He ended up in the belly of a fish. Thankfully, I did not. You know, because I don't know that I could have endured that. <laughs> but when Jonah came to his place of repentance, the fish spewed him out, and God was there saying, here's your call. And over the past two and a half to three years, that's where God met me in 2020. He said, here's your call. It hasn't been easy. I spent several, several months going through Tammy's ministry. I highly recommend Access Ministries. I tell people frequently, if you stubbed your toe on a coffee table when you were a child and every time you walk past the coffee table, if it still gives you anxiety, you need to schedule a session with Tammy. It doesn't matter how small or how great it is if it is keeping you from walking in the fullness of who you are in Christ and walking in the identity of who you're called to be, we need to give it over to God because it is not our place to carry those things. God does not want us oppressed. The Bible tells us that he's coming back for a bride who is without wrinkle and without spot. And this is how we make ourselves ready. And so through her ministry, God has healed me. I can't even begin to tell you how much he has changed my life. And in the process of all of this, in 2021, the pastor here at Life of Love, Pastor Jason, got up and he challenged the congregation to house the glory of God within themselves. You see, we're the temple, right? And I want to be like Peter, that I have so much of God in me that my shadow cast upon an individual and they are healed and set free. And so that became my pursuit. And in that moment, my pursuit of God's love for me changed. It was in that moment that my pursuit of God became, God, I love you. You are my everything as he began to completely saturate me with him, all I could think about is how wonderful and how great he is, right? Because I told my sister and I had this conversation yesterday, so when you think about how much your husband loves you, does it not make you love him more? She's like, yeah. I said, that's how it is with God. When I think about all the things that he has loved me through, 
Through all the pains and all the hurts, his love has been there. He says there is nothing that we can do to separate us from his love. His love is there and attainable for you. And when we receive his love, it flows in us. And then it flows out of us. And I am so in love with God. We were singing a song. And I asked the ladies earlier what the name of this song was, and I still don't remember. But it talks about how he, he's jealous for us. And there's, there's a chorus in the song where it says, Oh, how he loves us. And we, I was at a church service not very long ago, and they were singing this song. And I remember being in the congregation and singing, and I couldn't sing, Oh, how he loves, loves me. All I could sing was, Oh, how I love you. Because I love him with every ounce that I have. Everything inside of me is so in love with my God. And so in preparation for today, one of the things that he was telling me to share with you, and I asked him exactly what he meant, and he says, I want you to show them what it looks like for you to totally surrender. Because in my pursuit of him, that was the quest that he put on my heart. What does total surrender look like? And I remember we went to, we were in Dawsonville this October last year, and I got in the water, and I didn't really know why I was getting the water. Tammy and them will tell you I didn't really want to get in the water. So I'm like, I don't even know why I'm getting in the water. But I knew I had to get in the water. And I get in, and they ask you, you know, what are you wanting Jesus to do for you? And God says, surrender. So I shared that. And they prayed, and I go under the water. And for the first time in my life, I'm slain in the Spirit. And it kind of like, I realize it, I guess. I don't know, because it kind of scared me. And then all of a sudden, I hear a sweet voice say, I've got you. It's okay. And I remember being the stillest that I've ever been in my entire life. And God says, this is what total surrender looks like, even unto your breath is surrendered to me. And it's in that surrender that he began to speak. And he began to show me, and he said, I'm coming after you with fire. He said it three times. And I'm like, really, God? Because look at all this stuff you've done in my life. Look at where I was. I was disobedient. It took me a long time, but I've repented and I'm back here now. What do you mean you're coming after me with fire? I didn't fully understand it. So to, to surrender to the Lord when I'm at home, I have my quiet space. I go into my room. I have my ambient music playing. And it's just me and God. And I sit down. And I wait for a moment because it's not about me in this time. It's about him. And he takes me to our beach. And I can hear the sound of the waves rushing in. I can see the cliffs above me to my left and to my right. And then I see him coming. And as he's coming, he sits beside me. And as he sits there, there's no words, just me and him. And anybody who knows me knows I don't stay quiet very long, and I don't stay still very well. But I sit there, and then I just kind of lean into him, and he puts his arm around me, and all I can do is say, I love you. And I long for the day when I get to heaven and I can wrap my arms around my Savior and say, I love you. You are my love. You are my everything. And what's awesome is when we get to that place where he's our everything, he can move in our lives. The promises that he gives us at a young age and he says, I've called you to minister to women comes to fruition through surrender because he loves us because my love for him is now greater than the pursuit of his love for me 
And what I love even more about that is in June of 2021, I was driving home from Bedford. I drive for work sometimes. And God spoke to me and he says, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart and the forward will be greater than the former. I was like, God, that's awesome. What are the desires of my heart? You know, because when you're so in love with him, you don't really know what the desires of your heart are. So, I mean, I left it at that and just, okay, Lord, you know what you're doing. The next night I come to church and Pastor Jason comes up to me and he says, Faye, I feel like the Lord has a word for you. Can I give it to you? And I was like, sure. He said, he says he's getting ready to bring you the desires of your heart and the forward will be greater than the former. I think my jaw hit the floor and he looked at me and he's like, what? I said, God gave me that same word yesterday. I said, the awesome thing is, is I asked him, what are the desires of my heart? And he says, oh, well, that's a man. I said, no, it's not. I said, it is not a man. I said, I, me and God make a perfect team. I do not need a man in my life. When I get into my car, I listen to the praise and worship music I want to listen to. Nobody changes my channels. I go where I want to go. I do what I want to do. I do not need a man. He says, I'm telling you, God's bringing you a man. I disagreed, and for a year, I stood on that very firmly, very, very firmly. In January of this year, anybody who knows me know I, I work in IT, but when it comes to social media, I just am not a social media person. But I joined our alumni Facebook group, I guess is what it's called. I don't really know. And I started getting all these friends requests on Facebook, and most of them were friends I went to high school with. And in February, a gentleman shows up on my Facebook page, and I'm like, oh, he's probably somebody I went to high school with. So I friended him. Couple, I realized very quickly that he, I didn't go to school with him, because of course I looked at his Facebook page at that point in time, and shortly after that, he asked me to like his devotional videos that he does on YouTube and Facebook, and so I did. And in that, the very first video I watched, my heart was pulled in. I saw this man of God sharing his heart through videos. And for four and a half months, I stalked him. I mean, there's just no way around it. I did. I believe God knew where I was at in my walk with him and that he knew I needed that season to make sure that this person was the man that he portrayed to be. But during that season, I had a longing. Like I had to talk to this guy. I had to know if what he says on his videos is really who he is. Our story is unique and it takes a long time to tell, and I'm almost out of time. So a long story short, through different communications, I invited him here, and he invited me to his church. I met him on June 1st of this year. I walked out of the church that day, and I'd called Tammy and Shelly and said, I'm done. That's it. This guy's absolutely amazing. I get home and my sister says, so? I said, I'm done. My heart's done. I have it journaled because anybody who knows me knows I journal everything. In 2020, when I was first started meeting with Tammy, Tammy said, I want you to go home and dream with God and let God show you what he has for you. In 2020, God told me that he was going to bring me a mate. I said, if you're going to bring me a mate, I want a man who's sold out to you. And if he could be tall with dark hair and a well-trimmed beard, that would be great. <laughs> it was very specific. It, like I said, it's journaled. And um, he never ceases to amaze. 
The man I now date has a heart for God like no other and a love to minister to men like no other. And he is 6'4", with dark hair and a well-trimmed beard. And he is absolutely amazing. But those are the promises that God brings us. Even if they're promises that we're unsure about, you know, he's there. And he's bringing them to fruition. His mother is in the audience today. And it is, it is a privilege to know her and to know that the man that he is 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 absolutely amazing and that as a mother you should be honored i have i have a jason and shelly has a jason we kind of joke it's face jason and shelly's jason so that way people know who we're talking about but he really is an amazing man but all of that is because I was willing to look at my father and seek him for him. I didn't seek him for this conference. I didn't go after God. I'm going to come running after you so I can stand in front of all these women and talk. I didn't go running after God so that I could meet Jason Bell. I didn't do those things. I went running after God because I wanted God. I wanted his love. I wanted his purity. I wanted all of him. No longer restraining him. I tell people all the time, I'm at that place that I don't want to be God. Here's my box. Fill it. I want it to be Faye. Here's my box. Walk in it. And I want it to be my yes to him because I am a yes to him. He is my everything. And it doesn't matter where you've been at in your life. It doesn't matter the hurts, the pains, big or small. Like I said, if if you stubbed your toe on a coffee table, it doesn't matter. God is waiting for you. And he has a plan and a purpose and a call on your life. There's not one of us here that doesn't have a purpose. And I so love what you said this morning because my heart is on identity because when we know who we are in Christ we're invincible because we don't rely on ourselves to do things we rely on him right and it's not up to us just like with the water I was skeptical at first like many but then when you think about it it's just a point of contact to him and it's just a a method like Shelly said that he is using to heal deliver and set free so today you see all these white claws up here we dip them in the water at our immersion service this past Sunday night and we prayed over them and we prayed over them and we prayed over them they're just a point of contact You know, in Acts 19, 11, and 12, Paul talks about how, you know, he sent out his handkerchiefs and people were healed. This is the same. It's just a point of contact. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. And as they come up, I don't know what you need today. I don't know what God's plan for you is, but he does. And we're all we're going to do is just come into agreement with what you're seeking God for because it's not us. It's not. It's Him. Now, what these, this beautiful worship team didn't realize is I love that song, First Love. And I love Stephanie Gretzinger's version of it that she sang at the end, and end of her video for Presence 2022. If you've not watched it, I highly recommend it. So I've asked them, I have the video to play, but they, when they sang it, I asked them to come up. So they're going to sing first love again. And maybe you're at a place that you need to make him your first love. Because this conference is all about him loving you. So let's love him back. But we are going to come into agreement with you that whatever you're seeking, whatever God is showing you that he's wanting to minister in your life, 
we're going to come in agreement and believe that with you.